about Scaling Puppet. Hi, uh, I'm Stephen. I'm a systems administrator with Anchor, along with apparently 18 other people from Anchor this year. Um, and I'm going to talk about using iNotify to help. So for anyone who doesn't use Puppet or isn't familiar with it, it's a centralized config management system. By centralized, I mean that there are a number of nodes um, which run a Puppet agent and connect to a Puppet master, which um, tells them what their configuration should be, and then they go and apply that. Um, to give some background as to why we made the decisions, decisions we did, we use a single large production environment in Puppet with close to a thousand nodes. We also, in addition to those nodes, we also have some global virtual resources for things like monitoring on nodes that we don't run Puppet, which are then collected by monitoring servers. And we tend to use Puppet such that we make very small changes, often specific to one node, and we want to see that change take effect straight away. And that's a very slow workflow with Puppet, and I'll get to explaining why that is in a moment. So ultimately our goal in all this is when we make a change in Puppet, we want that to apply immediately when we roll out. And until a few months ago, we achieved that by, um, as part of our rollout process, restart the Puppet Master and it just repasses everything. The problem and the reason that this is slow is because the Puppet Master takes a long time to parse manifests into code internally. Um, the time taken is negli negli negligible with a few manifests. It's probably somewhere on the order of a second for every 20 manifests. But when you start getting close to a thousand nodes, that starts getting significant. So we, when you combine our nodes with the global virtual, resor virtual resources I mentioned, we have 1300 manifests that get parsed on every startup and that takes just over a minute. And to, to reiterate, that's a minute on every Puppet rollout because we're restarting the Puppet Master on every rollout. Um, the reason that's a problem is because the Puppet Master can't do anything else while it's parsing those. When you do a rollout and then you do an agent run, that agent run just hangs for just over a minute while the Puppet Master's not actually doing anything but reparsing code. Um, Puppet itself... Um, has a very very coarse internal caching. It, um, Puppet has the, the concept of environments and you can only expire code with upstream Puppet on a per envir environment basis. Um, since we use a single large production environment that is just as bad as doing a full restart because if, when you expire the environment you have to go and repass all that code anyway. The, there is the option of breaking up the nodes into separate environments and having, uh, say, uh, 10 or 20 nodes per environment. But we used to do something similar with multiple Puppet Masters back in the days of Puppet 2. Um, and we found that that didn't work well with our workflow, um, primarily because we tend to have, we have a very large set of standard management and it works best for us to keep that all in the one tree. So given that Puppet's caching doesn't suit our use case, we looked into what solutions we can implement ourselves. Um, we could have Puppet just pull the file system and see when files had changed. Um, one idea that was suggested was to have, um, because we manage all our Puppet manifests in Git, when we do a rollout we can have Git say to Puppet, these files have changed, please reload them. And there was the option of having the Puppet Master itself listen for files that have changed using iNotify. Um, if you're not familiar with iNotify, it's, um, it's a subsystem in the Linux kernel that um, you can say, please tell me when this file is modified or deleted or renamed or something, and the, the Linux kernel will then um, put notifications into a queue, and you can then process those notifications once you're ready. The thing with all three of these options is that they require Puppet to be able to remove code on a per file basis, which is, as I said, is something it can't do only on a per environment basis. So naturally the first step was to have it, um, have it be able to expire code. Um, 
this diagram is it's sort of a subset of what things look like internally in Puppet. You have a bunch of agents that connect to the Puppet Master in an environment. An environment contains a type collection. Each type is... The, the name type internally to Puppet can refer to a node, a class, or a defined type um, externally to Puppet. And each type contains a code block, which contains individual bits of code which might be function calls or strings or even other code blocks like if, if you have an if statement the if statement will typically contain another code block with more bits of code in it um, so that's kind of the structure that we were dealing with and we needed to be able to expire first of all if a type was defined in only one file we needed to be able to remove that entirely and if if a type was defined in multiple files, which typically only happens with the main class, um, if you're not familiar with Puppet internals, the main class is um, basically everything that's in top scope. If you don't put anything inside, if you don't put something inside a class, it's in a class with the name of an empty string, which is called the main class. So we need to be able to expire bits of code as well. So we implemented a general purpose file expiration mechanism that does just that. Um, there's a bit of it in the code for a type to remove bits of code, and there's more code in the type collection to remove entire types. And um, it actually worked out that we could do this without changing too many of Puppet's internal APIs, because each bit of code already had a, has associated with it file and line information. So we could just use that information to tell um, which to, to associate each bit of code and each type with a file and expire those as necessary. Um, because of the generic nature of the expiration API, this actually has nothing to do with iNotify yet. Um, this could be, be um, hooked into any external source of, um, of file changes or even a file polling API or something. So the first option we had to consider for what to hook into that API would be file system polling. That's by far the most portable, <coughs> but it's quite slow um, when you're having to poll um, thousands of files to figure out which ones have changed. That's not particularly efficient. It could be implemented as a fallback me mechanism, but we wanted to take advantage of the fact that our environment is all Linux, so um, we didn't implement this, but it probably wouldn't be too hard. Um, asking git for changes is, sounds very clean and efficient in the sense that um, git is kind of the definitive, def definitive history of what's changed. Um, it ties us to a git-based deployment model, which is not that big of a deal because um, we're not likely to stop using git anytime soon. <laughs> Um, it requires us to queue changes ourselves. Um, to, to expand on that, currently our rollout process doesn't um, have any locking in it. Basically, if two people roll out at the same time, it has the same effect because the, um, the Git repo, it just pulls from the, the, the current head of the Git repo, um, regardless, of when, regardless of who was rolling out at the time. Um, if we wanted to queue changes, we'd run into things like if two people roll out simultaneously, how do you know um, which changes have already been loaded in if the, the second person who's rolling out is, uh, is basing their changes on a commit before the first person that started rolling out and it gets complicated. Um, and because of the, those issues, it's very easy to introduce bugs. Um, and the last thing we wanted to do was um, accidentally introduce bugs that um, think changes have been loaded in but haven't and then end up with manifests that aren't actually being applied and then people are staring at the puppet manifests wondering why their code isn't actually taking effect. Um, third option, iNotify, ties us to Linux puppet masters which isn't a big deal either, um, doesn't tie us to Git. Um, the main reason why this option was appealing is that the iNotify code in the kernel has been around for many years and had a lot of testing done and everyone pretty much knows that it works so we didn't have to worry about any sort of queuing our, ourselves. So we evaluated this as having the least risk of introducing bugs. So we went with the iNotify option. Um, there are two places inside Puppet where um, manifests get loaded. Um, the initial importer is 
Um, historically, it's imported a single file, but now you, you can make that a directory. Um, and that does an initial import of files that should always be loaded. Um, so that we have those be reparsed when they change because they're not going to get loaded any other way. The autoloader is the easy bit. We can just remove that code and the next time something references, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the autoloader, um, in Puppet if you use a type or a class name that Puppet doesn't know about, it will go and try to find that um, type name um, in, in a module based on file naming rules, and that's easy because it, it will just auto-load it later, so we don't need to worry about reparsing that. Um, and this all happens at the start of a catalog compilation. So the Puppet Master sits there idling, waiting for an agent to connect. Files are changing under it. Um, agent connects, it processes the iNotify queue, loads in all the changes, and then passes a catalog onto the agent. Difficulties we encountered, um, the import function in Puppet, which is used to import other manifests, has been deprecated for a while, um, and it actually makes things more complicated um, because it's kind of a third way files can get imported, and in order to track that properly, you either need to reparse everything that changes or track all, track the complete graph of all imports so that at any one time you know whether a manifest has been imported or loaded. Um, and that's just annoying, so we just didn't bother with that. Um, so we wrote a patch that implemented that behavior, um, rolled it out, well, it initially rolled it out to a staging environment, and we found a pretty consistent 70 second speed up. Um, as I said, the um, it takes Puppet just over a minute to parse those 1,300 manifests at startup. So by rolling this out and not restarting the Puppet Master, um, we immediately saved 70 seconds on every agent run after a rollout. Um, but when we rolled this out to production, it had the additional effect of um, reducing the overall load on the Puppet Master so that it could generate catalogs more quickly. Um, I don't have any graphs of this because by the time I decided I wanted to do a talk on it, it was already more than 30 days after we'd rolled it out and um, the Puppet dashboard that we have only keeps it for 30, keeps data for 30 days. But if anyone else um, wants to use this code and has any interesting graphs to send me, please do. Um, but anecdotally, um, the, the best speed ups we had were five minutes on nodes with complex catalogs. Um, they were taking about um, eight minutes to run Puppet, and that got down to two or three. Um, so that's quite a drastic speed up. Of course, it doesn't help if, in, in cases where the slowness is on the agent side, um, for instance, when using types that are particularly slow to um, do their thing. Um, it doesn't help there because it's purely a master side speed up. The limitations, our initial implementation doesn't support the future parser. There's no technical reason for that aside from the fact that it wasn't a use case we needed to consider and it wouldn't be hard to make it implement, wouldn't be hard to implement that. Um, reopening a class in a different file is not supported. I'm not, we had a bit of a discussion about this and I, we, weren't sure if this was ever intended to be supported or if it worked by accident. Um, but we only support that for the main class because by definition everything in um, TopScope can be in any file. But um, in upstream Puppet you can define a class in one manifest and again in another manifest and your resultant class will be the merger of those two. Um, supporting that is complicated because we would need to track whether or not a uh, class has been loaded from multiple files, and if it hasn't, then expire the whole class. Otherwise, expire code from within the class. And it was just easier not to support it because we don't use it. And I'm doubtful as to whether anyone uses it. Um, as I said, the use of import is not supported, and that's something where we that's something that wouldn't be worthwhile supporting because it's being removed in Puppet 4 anyway. Um, and native Ruby code doesn't get reloaded, and that's another thing that wouldn't really be possible to support. Because the way that na native Ruby code gets loaded is Puppet just says, here you go, Ruby interpreter, do whatever you want to do with the Ruby code that's in this file. Um, 
which means we'd have to then hack the Ruby interpreter to be able to expire Ruby things. And because Ruby is not declarative as Puppet is, that is a lot more difficult. So we, the way we handle that is just if any native Ruby code has changed on rollout, restart the Puppet Master anyway to pick up the new changes. And you can get the source on GitHub. Um, there's also open document sources which are available, which you can use in the WTFPL if you want. Um, and there's also a link there to the Ruby iNotify bindings that we used um, in order to use iNotify. Um, the source that we have there depends on a yet unreleased version of the Ruby iNotify bindings. If you try to use it with the current version of Ruby iNotify, it, it will seem to work until you have an iNotify queue overflow, um, at which point it, the Ruby iNotify library will raise um, an exception. And by an exception, I mean the Ruby class called exception, which is not too easy to catch because then you end up catching every possible exception that would ever get raised. Um, so we, we've submitted a patch for that which has been merged into master but not yet made it into a release. So if you're going to use that code, just get the, um, the master branch of the RBI Notify gem and build your own um, gem from that um, so that you have that fix. Um, okay, that's it from me. Um, does anyone have any questions? We've got about five minutes for questions before the break. Any questions? Uh, I'm familiar with uh, iNotify and I think it's the most wonderful facility thanks to all the kernel hackers who made it work so well. Um, the uh, but I'm not familiar enough with the um, the way that Puppet uh, the Puppet Master um, loads the uh, uh, these the information from these files. So um, basically, what you're what you're doing is you can tell the Puppet Master to just reload only those things that have changed without sort of restarting the whole thing. Uh, is that what's going on? It's, um, it's like uh, the Puppet Master's got to read the whole um, manifest if otherwise, um, and you just want it to only load the things that have changed. Now, is that what's going on? Is that um, sort of like uh, with bind or DNS, say, just reload this zone and uh, leave everything else as it was? Almost, but not precisely. Um, what we're doing is... Um, um, what we're doing is to... Um, expire the, the entire contents of a manifest and then reload that whole manifest rather than reloading all 1300 manifests. Um, so we're not doing partial expiry of code within a manifest. Um, is that does that answer what you? Or? So I, I'm still uh, not very um, not I'm still not familiar enough with Puppet Manifests to be a hundred percent clear on that. But what you mean then is that uh, there are lots of manifests that the ma Puppet Master needs to reload, and that. The, it, what we're doing is figuring out which manifests to reload. Is that what? Yes. Is that what's going on? Okay. I think I'm with it now. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Up. I don't have a question. I just wanted to see you run up the stairs. No. Okay. Um, I'm, I have one question and possibly a follow-on, depending on your answer. Uh, is this a patch against the core Puppet code, or does this end up being a module that you effectively load? Uh, um, it's a, currently a patch against Puppet 3.7.3. Um, we haven't tested it against master yet, and it might require a bit of work because they've just completely removed the current parser from that code. Um, so my, my follow-on question then is, have you or are you considering 
pushing that change back to Puppet Labs, and if so, have they been amenable to that? Um, probably not the code we currently have because of the caveats that I mentioned. Um, once we've revised it so that it works properly with the Puppet 4 parser and whatnot, um, then we'll be looking to see if we can as, at least get the um, per file expiration API accepted and maybe a generic um, file system polling API because I know the Puppet Labs guys want to support more than Linux. Thank you. I look forward to hopefully seeing it in the future. Okay, it's afternoon tea time now. Please join me in thanking Stephen.